God's grace and peace to each and every one of you. Happy Sunday! Welcome to this time of worship. We do indeed give thanks that no matter where you're watching this, what time of the day it is, we are gathered here together in this sacred space on this holy day as we begin this holy season of Advent. We uh, once again get, uh, welcome the return of Christ in so many ways. Advent is not only that season, but it's also the new year of the church. And with each and every New Year's, we also bring our hopes, our expectations of renewal and revival, not only in our individual lives, but also collectively as a family of faith. And as this time of precaution, whenever it may end, we look forward to a time of renewal and revival in the life of our church. Speaking of renewal and revival and of worship, we invite you to join us here in the sanctuary if you are here in the area. Each and every Sunday morning we gather at for worship at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock for worship and uh, we do so with masks and distancing. After worship there's a little time of fellowship. But then uh, we convene again here in the sanctuary for a wonderful time of Bible study. It's our Sunday school with our professor Chris West and we look forward to to our Sundays together uh, each week. Well, let's begin our time of worship. Friends, here now, our call to worship. Here now, these opening words on this first Sunday of Advent. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come, let us go up to the mountaintop of the Lord. May we learn God's ways and walk in God's paths. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And will you pray with me now our opening prayer of the day. Gracious God, you call us to goodness and you lead us on right paths. You encourage us with signs of your coming and urge us to keep watch that we might greet you with hand, heads raised high when you come to offer your renewal and restoration. Guide us in your ways this season of Advent. Amen.
Today is the beginning of the Advent season. The dominant theme of Advent is, of course, Jesus coming into our lives, into our midst. And we think of Jesus doing that in, in three ways. First, as a baby born in Bethlehem. Second, as a living presence in our world today. And then finally, third, as a risen Savior who will come at the close of the age to reign in glory over all creation. And the familiar little snippet of our communion liturgy that we word captures this essence by remembering um, those words saying, Christ has come, Christ is here, Christ will come again. The gospel lesson that we have for today focuses on this last part of the trilogy, the so-called second coming of Christ or the final return of Christ, however you want to word it. But we gather here by the Advent wreath and this year is particularly a, a heartbreaking aspect because each year we look forward to our children gathering around the Advent wreath during our moment with our children and youth. And uh, we talk about each different candle and look forward as they, uh, as they delightfully uh, light each candle for each Sunday. The season of Advent invites us to look back into time. We remember all the way back to before Jesus, back to the time of his humble birth. We remember also back in our own times, back in memory to the previous Christmases we have experienced in our own lives. We remember the family traditions, the customs lovingly preserved year after year, the favorite recipes, the worn tree ornaments carefully removed from worn boxes and wrappings to shine for one more year. Advent also invites us to look forward to the fulfillment of human history, to the ongoing process of redemption and salvation, and to remember Christ's coming in his activity in our own lives. Advent is all about God, a God who entered into human history in Jesus Christ, and a God who promises to continue to return in your history and mine the history that is still ahead of us. Advent comes quietly to invite us, all of us, lifelong believers, skeptics, seekers, the curious, the unbelievers, we are invited to ponder for a moment a most incredible and most improbable idea, namely that a humble birth in Bethlehem is the advent of God, the coming of God into our lives. That behind all the religious rituals human beings have devised, that there is this, a little child in a manger. That behind all the strenuous theologizing, all the intellectual abstractions and all the theological textbooks in the world, there is this, a newborn and a mother's and a father's awe and love and gratitude. And this is what God is like. This is who God is, that vulnerable child, that courageous and honest and good man in Christ. Advent is an invitation to trust that God, to give your heart to that God, to trust your future to the God who promises to be with you and to come into your life with healing and hope and peace. And so remembering that we light the very first candle of Advent. Will you pray with me now as we prepare to read and reflect on God's word for our time together? Loving how we begin this season of Advent in preparation as we are filled with hope and we are filled with joy just as we prepare and decorate our homes for Christmas. May we also, by your word and promise, Prepare our hearts for the coming of the Christ child. Be with us during this time of reflection. Guide and inspire us to further your kingdom with your peace, your love, and your grace. Amen.
Again, hear now these words from the Gospel of Mark, our Gospel passage for today. Jesus said, But in those days after that suffering, the sun will also be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not always know when the time has come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you all is keep awake. We give thanks for the reading and the hearing of God's word for us today. Well, I suspect that for most of us, the turkey and the stuffing are just barely out of our systems. But here we are, plummeted into the first Sunday of Advent. Whether we're ready, or ready for it or not, Advent is here. Time is a funny thing. You know, we spend our days trying to control time. We attempt to slow time down when life begins to move too quickly, when our kids are growing up too fast, or when society's pace seems to be out of control. Or we try to speed it up when we are anxious for a hopeful result, when we are little kids waiting for grandma and grandpa coming to our house. We try to speed up when things aren't coming as soon as we would hope. And then sometimes we play our own view, version of beat the clock, trying to conquer time and fit more into our days than is humanly possible. Well, the scriptures on this first Sunday of Advent speak of time. The epistle from Paul writes, you know what time it is. Our gospel passage says, you can't possibly know the day and the hour. But both Paul and James are referencing time relative to the promised day of the fulfillment of all time, as Tom Long puts it, puts it, the great climax of all human history and longing, when the world spinning along in ceaseless tedium will find itself gathered in the extravagant mercy of God. 800 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah began to tell the people that help was on the way. He writes, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Isaiah would later prophesy, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then... The waiting began. For eight centuries, the people of Israel would remember the words of Isaiah and wonder, when is this Savior going to arrive? Twenty generations hoped that the Messiah would arrive in their lifetime. They waited, sometimes patiently, other times not so patiently. And then in about 4 BC, a man named John the Baptist showed up and renewed Isaiah's cry. The time is near, John said. Straighten up, fly right, because the promised one is just around the corner. On a day when we might expect to hear the familiar details of shepherds and stables and stars, we are met with a gospel lesson that instead tells of thieves and heavens shaken 
and we ask ourselves, what in the world is up with Advent? Why do we begin here with stories of the end? Familiar theme connects all of our passages today. The theme, of course, is waiting. And does anybody like to wait? Do you like to wait in traffic or wait on the phone on hold? Wait in line at the bank or the grocery store? Do you like to wait for news? The silence of waiting can sometimes be excruciating. A woman was rushed and to the hospital in critical condition. Her husband waits patiently in the waiting room. After a few minutes, the doctor comes out and he asks his assistant for a wrench, which understandably concerns the husband. Then after a couple more moments, the doctor re-enters the room, this time asking for a screwdriver. And the man grows worried and begins to pace in circles. Then a little later, the doctor bursts through the door, screaming for a hammer. And at that, the husband, in an already in a state of frenzied terror, runs up to the surgeon and says, Doctor, I can't wait any longer. I have to ask, what in the world is wrong with my wife? And the flustered doctor replies, I don't know. I can't get my medical bag open. All right, well. Henry Nouwen writes, waiting is not a very popular attitude. In fact, most people consider waiting to be a waste of time. Perhaps this is because the culture in which we live is basically saying to us, get going, do something. And for many people, waiting is an awful desert between where they are and where they want to go. Now let's hold that thought in our minds for just a, a minute. Where we've been, where we are, and where we want to go. In contrast to some Eastern religions that view time as an endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, Christianity with its Jewish roots is a deeply historical religion. We Christians look backward, remembering God's mighty acts of salvation over the generations. We look forward, anticipating the vindication of God's ways in a new heaven and a new earth. And Karl Barth said, as Christians, we live between the times. The season of Advent invites us to consider this nature of living between the times. Living between the times, we give thanks to God for the Christ child, even as we offer prayers for God's kingdom of love and peace to come on earth as it is in heaven. Again, as I mentioned before, on a day when we might expect to hear the familiar details of shepherds and stables and stars, we're met with a gospel lesson that uh, leaves us to ask, what is up with Advent? Why do we begin at the end? Well, perhaps it's because as people of faith, getting ready is not about just about the lights. It's not just about the Christmas poinsettias, the wreaths and the Christmas trees. As people of faith, getting ready is also about the heart. It's about taking an inventory of our lives in order to be prepared for the Christ who is surely coming again and again into our lives. Barbara Brown Taylor writes this wonderful little uh, piece of advice, spiritual advice. She says, every morning when you wake up, decide to live the life that God has given you to live right now. Refuse to live yesterday over and over again. Resist the temptation to save your best self for tomorrow. She says, live a caught up life, not a put off life, so that wherever you are, you are ready for God. Jesus was always proclaiming, don't be afraid. We remember how Jesus constantly said that throughout the gospel passages and with words of empowerment, Jesus wanted people to pay attention to what was already happening and to take notice of what God would be doing next. And alertness then wasn't about danger, but was about new life, in breaking grace, joy to the world. 
In our gospel passage, seeing the signs in turn would encourage believers to slowly accept God's new way to stand up to injustice and to speak truth to power. Seeing the signs, we recognize that our spiritual lives are slowly changed for the better as the message and the meaning of Christ permeates our being. Well, in my own life, I get the sense that this is how restoration seems to work. This is how redemption seems to seep in and resolve issues. Think of a troubled relationship that was mended. Think of a tough time in your life that was eased or resolved. More times than not, resolution or redemption comes slowly and is guided by signs of grace and of love along the way. Last night, I saw a commercial on NBC that the film, It's a Wonderful Life, will be shown Christmas Eve this year. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely adore that film and find myself watching it just about each and every year. However, I do wonder why in the world it's a beloved Christmas film. Because when you think about it, most of it is dark. It's, it's just some aspects are extremely depressing as well. Although it begins with a rousing and optimistic opening that places young George Bailey in a position to take on the world, through one circumstance or another, George quickly finds himself taking on the responsibilities and the tasks that he would rather not. And ultimately, through an error of one of his employees, good old Uncle Billy, George faces bankruptcy, scandal, and the possibility of a jail sentence. George becomes, so, George becomes so overwhelmed that he considers taking his own life. Of course, we all know the story. Clarence, the angel, shows him an alternate reality where George was never born. And slowly, very slowly, it's almost an hour of the film, very slowly but surely, through signs and visions, George is redeemed. George is restored, and his homecoming is heightened with an outpouring of love and support from his family and his friends. Again, this is how it seems to work. Slowly, slowly but surely, and in surprising ways. Redemption and restoration seep into our lives, and you can see the signs as we look back that were placed on paths to our healing and our wholeness. Well, one of the absolute joys of my adult life has been your giving me this opportunity to serve as pastor of this church. And as we all know, our family of faith has endured some wonderful times as well as some rocky times over its 175 years. And even during our time here together, we've experienced highs and lows times of revival and times of challenge. Well, as we think about all of them all together, when those challenging times happen in our life together, including this time of precaution due to COVID-19, we know that as we think about our 175 years together, we know that eventually, and somehow, and in some way, redemption and restoration will begin to seep into our family of faith and will be placed once again on the path to healing and to wholeness. It doesn't happen overnight, but healing indeed does happen. Our scripture reminds us to hold on to the signs that point to the future, optimistic signs that point to a revival of ministries, a revival of outreach. And when our current circumstances allow, when coronavirus dies down, I look forward to a time of kickoffs and rallies and revivals, celebrations of our life together as a family of faith, for which we are all extremely grateful and appreciative. Well, the good news of Advent is not simply that Christ is coming, but that in his coming, we can hope. Despite all that may be falling apart in our lives, Despite all that may be falling apart in our 
communities and in the world around us, just as the leaves of the fig tree offer hope in late winter that summer is coming again, so God's word in Jesus promises us new life. Advent offers us expectation and hope for something new. Stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Be alert at all times. May we indeed begin this Advent season with the prediction and the expectation that God's kingdom is already breaking forth here in our world, even as we await the joyful, holy, and humble welcome of our Prince of Peace, the little baby in a manger, our risen Lord. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our service of worship now moves towards a time of prayer where we remember the joys and the concerns of our individual lives, cherished loved ones that we hold close in our thoughts and our prayers. Also remember family and friends, individuals in our community and in our nation and in our world. When it comes to our family of faith, we continue to hold Teen Abernathy in our thoughts and prayers as she remains hospitalized at Catawba Hospital with uh, respiratory issues. Uh, we do indeed pray that she feels our 
love and support surrounding her as she receives uh, excellent medical care. At the same time, we also remember her family. Heartbreaking aspect is not being able to visit as much as we would like during this time due to all the precautions that are in place. And so we remember the Abernathy family as they surround Teen with their love and support. I continue to give thanks on behalf of my extended family for your love and support for uh, my wife's grandmother and uh, Alex and Lee's uh, great-grandmother. We uh, I remember Grandma Tucker as she's receiving uh, excellent care at uh, Trinity Village in her final days. And again, we continue to give thanks for uh, your love and support for uh, our family during this time. Just as we remember individuals who we hold very close in our thoughts and our prayers, we also remember uh, some individuals who have had some uh, successful surgeries and medical procedures and medical care. Continue to give thanks for uh, the medical care that Buddy Rader continues to receive rehabilitation at um, Abernathy Laurels and give thanks for the fact that he is on track to uh, go home on Wednesday. And so we do indeed pray for a uh, successful transition home. Judy Geithner, after having a fall and breaking her ankle, had excellent uh, surgery this past Tuesday, and um, obviously we are extremely pleased with the progress that she is already making, and we know that uh, when you break your ankle, it's a, it's a rather slow recovery, so we do indeed uh, surround prayers of, of uh, patience and healing around uh, Judy. We also give thanks for the care that Mark and her wonderful family is, is giving her as well. We know that there are other individuals in our lives that we bring to this time. Those individuals that we think about throughout the day and hold close in our thoughts and prayers. And we bring them as well. And as always, I'll have a time of silence during our prayer. And invite you to remember at that time those individuals that you're holding close in prayer. Friends, let's come together and pray. Loving God, you reveal yourself in so many ways. And in this Advent season, we give thanks for the way that you have revealed yourself in your Son, Jesus Christ. We gather up the prayers of our family of faith for the church, for the world, all who are in need, confident that you know our deepest thoughts and will refresh and renew our spirits. As we begin our Advent journeys, we give thanks for the many ways that your people are reaching out to those who need your hope, your love, and your mercy. And gracious God, fill us with the breath, the spirit, and the joy of this season, and stir us to extend ourselves beyond what we thought possible. As a family of faith, we remember now our own personal joys and our concerns for cherished loved ones who are suffering emotional or physical issues in their lives. God, we lift them to you in prayer. Loving God, hear now in these moments of silence the prayers of our hearts. Eternal God, today we remember Teen, we remember the Tucker family, we remember Buddy, we remember Judy, we remember all the individuals that we have remembered during this time together. God, we pray that each of these individuals will be filled with your love, an overwhelming sense of your joy and your comforting presence in this time of need. God, with the Love of Advent in our hearts, guide us to know that you are the center of our lives. Show us how to love you by giving of ourselves to the love and care of others. And help us to experience the power of the Holy Spirit coming into situations which we cannot control. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we conclude our time of worship on this first Sunday of Advent, as we bask in the glow of the hope candle, we pray that in this new week, that as we get ready for this Christmas, we remember and celebrate the Christmases of the past. Uh, in this Advent season, we look forward to the seasons coming up and beyond of the return again and again of Christ coming into our lives, including that final coming when all may know and experience God's love and God's joy, when all may know that they are surrounded with the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>